off Holy Week. Today, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Mark 14. Mark 14, and I'm going to do verses 1 through 11. And we're going to look at another uh, Passion Week story, something that happens in the Passion Week. Mark 14, 1 through 11, we're going to talk about two different responses to Jesus. Some people oppose Jesus. As a matter of fact, a lot of people oppose Jesus. And then other people adore Jesus. We're going to see both of those in the text this morning. I'll read it in its entirety, verses 1 through 11, and then we'll break it apart and, and take a look in a little bit more detail. Mark chapter 14, verse 1. It was now two days before the Passover, the feast of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him, that is Jesus, by stealth, and to kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. Two different ways that people respond to Jesus. And I want to point out that Mark, in, in, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Mark has done something in this text that's really important for you to see. And the reason I'm including all of verses 1 through 11 in really three different stories is because Mark is using something called inclusio to make a, a specific point. You'll notice that verses 1 and 2 are about people who are opposed to Jesus. Verses 10 and 11 is about someone else who is opposed to Jesus. Verses 3 through 9 is about someone who adores Jesus greatly. And what Mark does is he actually, as we'll see in a minute, he actually takes these stories out of chronological order, I believe, on purpose to highlight what's happening in the middle. And he takes a story and he puts a bookend on one side that's opposing Jesus and a story, uh, a bookend on the other side that's opposing Jesus in order to highlight against the foil of two groups of people that oppose Jesus— to highlight what it looks like to adore Jesus. So this morning we're going to look at those who oppose Jesus first. We'll look at the two bookends first, and then we'll look at the adoring in the middle, the peace in the middle uh, after that. So verses 1 and 2, we're going to meet the chief priests and the scribes. And I want you to see that it says, it was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And I want you to get some context of where we're at and what's happening in that day. How many of you have lived here in this uh, Puyallup area for more than like five years? Let's just, let me just ask it like that. Okay, so most of you. So you guys know that every September this crazy event happens in downtown Puyallup that turns downtown Puyallup into just carnage, right? Because people from all over the state and all over the world think that they need to come to our tiny, beautiful little downtown district to do something. And what is it? The fair. It's not fair is what it's not if you live here, Right? But what happens is people get excited and the fair's coming and we can't wait for the fair and the scones. I know they're 250 and they used to be a dollar, but now it's amazing and I'm excited. I want to ride the roller coasters, spend my life savings so my kids can have five minutes of fun on roller coasters that, by the way, last year two of them crashed into each other. It's true, it's on the news. But people get really excited about the fair, and thousands and thousands of people flood the fair. In fact, on those Sundays, when you leave here to go back to your home after being at church, on those fair Sundays, the line of traffic goes all the way down the hill, doesn't it? You ever get stuck in that, right? Some of you don't come to church all September because you're afraid of the traffic. Go to the early service. What, what, what happens in our city, though, is that people get super excited once a year about this event that takes place and lots of additional people flood our city. Passover was one of those times in the Jewish calendar where this happened in Jerusalem. That 
some secular historians of that day, like first century historians, have said that, that the, the population in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus on a normal given day or week would have been maybe thirty to 50,000. And, and there's a lot of discrepancies in, in the way that different people counted these numbers. But here, here they are. thirty to 50,000 people normally in Jerusalem. That when something like Passover, and this was the most important of the three festivals, when Passover happened, it could, it could, the population could swell to 300,000 people. Uh, Josephus, a first century historian, actually said a million people could be in Jerusalem and the surrounding area. You imagine the traffic problems, right? You can't get a scone anywhere in that situation. But the reason was because this was their Super Bowl. This was their Easter. This was their time. Do you remember what Passover was all about? Passover went back a a thousand over a thousand years for them and passover was all about deliverance the god of the bible the god of the old testament delivered his people called them out of the nation of egypt great signs and wonders gave them an identity and he delivered them and passover was all about deliverance by the time you got down to jesus's day they were looking for deliverance once again they were looking for a messiah once again and every year Passover would happen. Religious fervor, religious excitement. We can't wait. This is going to be great. And they said that you could smell and hear the sacrifices happening, right? That the temple was the place on the Temple Mount. If you've seen pictures, the temple was just overwhelmed in the priests with all the sacrifices that were happening and all of the smells and the sights and all of the things that were happening associated with that. You could smell throughout the city. And it's a time of great excitement. And the reason that I want you to grasp where we're at in this text is because of these words. It was two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and to kill him. That whole party was directed by a group of people. That whole thing was overseen by a group of people. You know who they were? The chief priests. This was their party. This was their event. This is the thing that they're inviting everybody to. They're the ones with the authority. They're the ones who spent their lives and their year getting ready and prepared for this whole thing. This is their time, and Jesus is impinging on their time. In fact, Jesus is threatening their time. It says that they were seeking to, by stealth, arrest him and kill him. Why by stealth? The text tells us that they were seeking to arrest and kill him by stealth, Because, the end of verse 2, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. You see, people were following Jesus and not them. People were beginning to follow and and watch and look at Jesus and not them. I want you to know that there are people who oppose Jesus. The chief priests and the scribes are an example of people who oppose Jesus because, folks, Jesus is threatening. Jesus is threatening to who they are. Jesus is threatening to their religious identity. They were the ones in control. They were the ones in charge. This is their show, and Jesus threatens their religious identity. Jesus threatens their religious authority. Jesus comes with a message that undermines their authority. When Jesus says, hey, there's a Messiah, and it's not those guys, it's me, he's undermining their religious authority. He's actually even undermining and threatening their sense of peace and prosperity. As you know, at this time in history, uh, in Jerusalem, the Israelites, God's people, were not in control of themselves at this time. They were under what? Roman rule. And the Romans really valued something called Pax Romana, or Roman peace. And they would have peace at all costs. And so on these days, and it's actually documented that there would be garrison of soldiers right there in the Temple Mount. And the Roman soldier's job was to make sure that the religious fervor didn't go too far. That you can be excited about God and excited about sacrifices, but this better not go too far or we're going to squelch that. And so part of the chief priest's job was to make sure that the party didn't get out of control. But when it did, as it often did, and Jesus wasn't the first person to come in at Passover and say, hey, I'm the Messiah, follow me, that the Romans would come down and and violently put out these uproars. And so what the chief priests needed to happen is they needed everybody to do what they said and worship their way 
they needed to be in control and they needed to be in authority they needed to be the ones calling the shots they needed to be the ones who was who were keeping the peace and that's how their lives remained peaceful and prosperous and jesus comes in and he threatens all of that but i would submit to you that jesus threatens all of those same things today that jesus threatens people's sense of identity that for the typical person in 21st century america my identity is all about who me right i am the ident i am the authority in my life jesus threatens all of that when jesus comes in and he says that for the, for you want to follow me deny yourself take up your cross and follow me is that threatening at all to your sense of identity and your sense of authority your sense of having your own purpose that jesus threatened their peace threatened their prosperity jesus ever threatened the peace in your life the prosperity in your life you think but but lord my life is going this way and this is how i've got it planned out come alongside bless my plans and then jesus if i got a different plan for you like oh that threatens correct yeah because at the end of the day just like with the chief priests, just like with the scribes like jesus is threatening and there are people who oppose jesus because jesus is threatening in addition to that when we go to the next verses <clears throat> verses 10 and 11 we see someone else who opposed jesus don't we then judas iscariot who is one of the 12 now can we talk about bible names that nobody names their kids right every time you read judas or somebody says judas like even in modern culture judas would be a bad name to call somebody right and there's a, a actual reason for it as we know every time judas is mentioned in the biblical gospels by the way every time that he's mentioned even before the passion week he's mentioned early he's mentioned later every time there's this designation of him being a betrayer or a traitor in some way every time it's almost as if, as if matthew mark luke and john wanted us to know something about the character of judas when they wrote every single time he's a traitor he's the betrayer he's the bad guy this is the evil guy don't name your kids after this guy jesus even had a younger brother a half brother named judas and he went by the shortened form jude we have a book of the bible written by him right he's like i don't want to be called that guy it's kind of like having the name adolf right it's like i'm going to steer clear of that one we're going to go by the middle name let's do something different then judas iscariot who was one of the 12 judas had been with jesus from maybe not the very beginning but close to the beginning judas had been with jesus a long time now, interesting side note as far as we know judas is the only one of the 12 original disciples who was from judea in the south and not galilee in the north so probably nobody really knew a lot about him but he had been following jesus for a long time and you can go back in the gospel accounts and you can see that jesus said I think it's John chapter 6, very early on, Jesus knew from the beginning who it was that would betray him. This was no secret to Jesus. Interestingly, though, we never see the other disciples questioning Judas. It's almost as if G Judas knew how to slide in, knew how to fit in, knew how to blend in with everybody else, right? And Judas is a bit enigmatic because, again, we get a few stories. We'll see he'll show up again in a few minutes in a cross-reference that I'll use. But we don't know a whole whole lot about judas we do know that the text says that judas agreed to betray jesus here we also know from john's account that it says that satan put it in judas's heart to betray jesus judas's life is actually a really good example of divine uh, sovereignty and human responsibility and how those two pieces go together especially as it pertains to evil because judas was completely culpable for what he did yet at the same time we see that satan was at work in his heart i'll speak to that again a little bit more in just a moment but i'll tell you a few things actually one of the works that was very helpful to me in this john MacArthur wrote a book called 12 ordinary men you may have heard of it he does a small biography one chapter on each of the 12 uh, disciples and the last chapter in that book is on judas and here's some of what he has to say about judas just compiling the biblical evidence macarthur says this judas was probably a young zealous patriotic jew who did not want the romans to rule and who hoped christ would overthrow the foreign oppressors and restore the kingdom to israel 
this was a common messianic expectation in that day. People, as I said, they were looking forward to the Messiah. There had been a few hundred years of silence since God had spoken through the prophets in the Old Testament. And people were looking forward to the Messiah who was going to come and from a military standpoint, bring true peace to the people of God. There had actually even been a few of those through those silent years. The, the one previous to this that made the most noise was about 100 years before Jesus made a great deal of noise. And so they were looking for this person. So when Jesus comes preaching his message, there were those who misunderstood his message and superimposed their expectations onto Jesus and said, oh, he's come to relieve us from the military might of Rome and from the authority of Rome. And he's come to, to release us and to bring us freedom. And MacArthur is saying Judas was most likely one of those people. He was young. He was zealous. He was patriotic. I don't know anybody that's like that here. He didn't want the Romans or the Democrats to rule, and he hoped Christ— oh, I'm sorry, that wasn't actually in the text. You were uh, looking to sleep, and I wanted to make sure that we were good. But Judas didn't want the Romans to rule, and he hoped that Christ would overthrow those foreign oppressors. He says this, he obviously could see that Jesus had powers like no other man, right? Judas was there in the boat when Jesus calmed the storm, as far as we know. Jesus was there at the feeding of the 20,000 as, as Jesus multiplied the bread and the loaves. Judas was there at all these different events. He saw and he knew Jesus has power to do things that other people don't have the power to do. He so said there, there is plenty of reason for a man like Judas to be attracted to that. Here's what I would submit to you. Judas is an example of someone who opposes Jesus because Jesus can be disappointing. I want to see it real with this for just a moment this morning. If we're honest, I believe that we could all go back to times in our lives where maybe we were a little bit disappointed by Jesus. Disappointed by something that Jesus did or didn't do more likely in our own lives. I think that at the end of the day, that what Judas was looking for was not what Jesus came for. What Judas wanted is not what Jesus provided. And as it got closer to the time where they realized that this thing was coming to an end, that it looked like the plane was going to crash and not land on the runway, and Judas was looking for a way off. And he was looking for the easiest way off to make some money to save himself and care for himself. When the text says in John's gospel that Satan put it in the heart of Judas to betray Jesus, here's what I believe. I believe that, that Satan used disappointment and discontentment to get into Judas's heart. I see a great deal of disappointment, discontentment. You could also say that those things lead to a disillusionment, right? But I would say this, I'd have to ask myself, have there been times in my life that I've become disillusioned with Jesus? That the expectation that I placed on Jesus was not a biblical expectation. That what I thought Jesus was going to do in my life was not a biblical expectation of Jesus. And when Jesus didn't meet my expectations, then I started to get discontent. I started to get disappointed. And ultimately, I started to find myself being disillusioned with Jesus. Church, people walk away from Jesus all the time because they thought Jesus was going to do one thing, Jesus did something else, and then they weren't happy about it. People oppose Jesus because at times Jesus can be disappointing. He's disappointing if we don't have his expectations in mind. Because when I have my expectations, when I have my understanding of what Jesus is going to do in my life and not Jesus' understanding, right? And it's not wrong to want Jesus to do things for it's not wrong to want Jesus to heal your marriage. But it is wrong if Jesus doesn't heal your marriage in the way that you want it healed. It is wrong to become discontent and disillusioned by him because he didn't do what you wanted. It's not wrong to want Jesus to change things about your financial security. But when he doesn't do it the way that you want it, how do you respond? When he doesn't do it the way that I want it, when he doesn't put me in the place or in the career or in the spot that I think that I deserve or should be, how do I respond? And Judas is a great example of a guy who gets disappointed with Jesus because of unmet expectations and unrealistic and unbiblical expectations. And you can just see this happen in his life. As we come down to the end of the gospel accounts, each of the gospel accounts, you're going to see, even in where I go in just a minute, in John's gospel, you're going to see this thing just unravel in his heart and unravel in his life. 
One more quote from MacArthur. He says this, The other 11 apostles are all great encouragements to us because they exemplify how common people with typical failings can be used by God in uncommon, remarkable ways. You guys have heard of Peter before, right? Lots of failures. <coughs> Judas, on the other hand, stands as a warning about the evil potential of spiritual carelessness, squandered opportunity, sinful lusts, and hardness of heart. The life of Judas reminds us that it is possible to be near Christ and to associate with him closely and yet become utterly hardened by sin. Judas reminds us of this very simple spiritual principle, church. Close does not equal close. Okay? When it comes to Jesus, close does not always equal close. What I mean by that is you may have grown up in Sunday school class, in Awana, in youth group, in church. You may know all the verses. You may have given the tithes. You may know all the arguments for five-point Calvinism. You may know all the things that you need, think that you need to know. Close doesn't equal close. Judas heard the same messages that all the other apostles heard. Judas saw Jesus do all the same things that the rest of the guys saw him do. But I think it's the end of the Gospels, and then if I remember correctly in Acts, they start to talk about the 11. Isn't that sad? He goes from talking about the 12 to talking about the 11 for that brief period of time. And the reason is is because there were 11 who were freaked out and who were scared. And as we'll see next week, like they were in the upper room biting their nails and freaking out. But at the end of the day, the resurrected Jesus came and changed their hearts and changed their lives and they moved forward. But there was one guy who didn't. And that's Judas. And I think Judas helps us all to ask ourselves, in what way have I been disappointed by Jesus? And for some of you, you'll say, well, that sounds heretical. I'm not saying that Jesus himself is a disappointment. I'm saying that our expectations of Jesus calls us to be disappointed. And we each have to ask ourselves, is there a place where I may be in some way disappointed by Jesus because I've put the wrong expectations on him? And then what does that do in my heart and do in my life? And again, as I said, I think that Mark wrote this, I'm going to show you why right now, in such a way that he takes these two bookends of people who oppose Jesus because Jesus is threatening, oppose Jesus, again, as, as Judas did. And he puts these two bookends together, so he highlights what's in the middle. People do this today as they write, they create a foil. You want to show the goodness of one character you create really bad characters around them to heighten the goodness of that good character i believe that's what mark is doing here right now in mark 14 verses 3 through 9 we have a story of a woman who anoints jesus there are actually four stories in the gospel accounts of of a woman who anoints jesus in matthew chapter 26 in mark chapter 14 and in john chapter 12 we have what i believe is the same story of a woman her name is mary her brother Lazarus was raised by Jesus. She had a sister named Martha. That's who I believe we're talking about here. Matthew, Mark, and John tell the same story. Luke chapter 7, I believe, is a different story at a different time in a different location. The details are very different. But what happens is when we, in a moment, turn to John 12, as we will in just a minute, you're going to see that it looks like this event actually took place before the triumphal entry. And in our text in John, it actually says that it took place, it looks as if it says it took place after the triumphal entry. So I'm going to explain why that looks like that. In not only Jesus' day, but really in, in most of history, there were uh, different ways that you could record, that historians would record history. Some would do it thematically, and others would do it chronologically. We're a very linear and chronological culture. We like things very chronological. Most, especially Eastern cultures, are very different even today. I believe that Matthew and Mark wrote thematically, and so they took the different stories and they lined them up in, in the way that they did um, to help us to understand a, a particular theme that they were trying to get across. So when we go to John's gospel, we find that this story of Mary anointing Jesus actually took place before, and now Mark says it took place, it looks as if he sa it says he took place after uh, the triumphal entry. If you're in Mark chapter 14, I want you to look at verse 1. It says, now two days before the Passover in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. If you go down to verse 3, Mark 14, 3, it says, and while he was still at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. There's not a time stamp at verse 3. So I believe what happened is that Mark took a story that happened a few days before and put it here. Normal for historians in that day to do that. 
and he put it there on purpose so that, again, that he can draw a contrast between the bad people on either side and this woman who he wants us to see adoring and worshiping Jesus. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, but let's look at the text for now. While he, verse uh, Mark 14, 3, while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. Now, was, was Simon still a leper? Anybody? No, Simon was not still a leper. You didn't hang out at the leper's house, okay? Simon was not still a leper. Some have wondered, did Jesus heal Simon of leprosy? Or somehow, how was Simon healed of leprosy? One way or another, Simon's not a leper anymore. We can, we can be sure of that. But they're at his house. And it says that he, Jesus, is reclining at the table. I think we should get back to reclining at table, don't you? That's right. A woman, as I said, her name is Mary. A woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard. If you look at the picture on the screen behind me, it probably looked a lot like that. At least that's what Google told me. I'm just saying. No, I'm just kidding. That's actually probably really close. Archaeological findings, that's really close to what it looked like. And you'll notice it's just one piece they put the ointment in there, and then they would seal it off so that it, it was a little bit different than ladies, your perfume today, where you open it, you dab a little on, and then you put it back, and you dab a little more on, you put it back. This, break the top, pour it all out. It's a one-and-done type of deal. It says that it was pure nard. This was something that was imported from India. It was imported from a long way off, and it was cosmetic. It was not medicinal in function. This was something that they did, gentlemen, they did to make themselves smell nice and smell good. And in a day when they didn't take baths a lot, you walked around after camels a lot, you needed something. There's a spiritual lesson here, men. Jesus is a dude and he wears perfume. It might be like deodorant. She says it was very costly. We'll see what that looks like in a minute. She broke the flask and poured it over his head. As we're going to see, this is an audacious thing that she does. I want you to notice and to realize that this is something, again, that she's not just taking something off the shelf, using a little bit, and putting it back. Um, some have, have suggested that this may have been uh, an heirloom that was passed down from generation to generation to generation. And that when Mary does this, there's no going back. She's giving what was most likely the most expensive gift that she had, the most expensive thing that she could give she was given to Jesus, and I want you to see that she was going all in, right? She was going all in. There's no half-hearted worship. There's no Baptist, like, hands right here when she's singing the worship song. She's calling field goals. She's going all in with her worship. Verse 4, there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? Because there's always somebody who complains when you go all in on worship, Right? There's always somebody. I'll be in the front row singing, swaying a little bit. You know somebody's in the back judging me. I get it. They're like, oh, my gosh, can't believe he's doing that. He doesn't even have deodorant on. The ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii. Now, here's some reference for you. When Jesus is going to feed the twenty to 25,000 people, we call it the feeding of the 5,000, there was twenty to 25,000 people there, Okay. When Jesus is going to do that, the disciples come and they're like, um, what are we going to do here? And he's like, well, feed them. And they're all like, they said, Jesus, it would take 200 denarii to feed 25,000 people. Oh, that puts it in some perspective, right? The gift that she gives is enough money to buy lunch for everybody to fill Safeco Field. Safeco, it's not that, what is it called now? Yeah, T-Mobile? T-Mobile Park. You know what I'm talking about? Fill that place with people and buy them all a hot dog. That's what she gave away. And so these people are indignant. Why was it wasted? That money could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. Doesn't that sound really good? Give it to the poor. You don't need to give it to Jesus. You could feed a lot of... Actually, you know what? If it was that many people that could have been helped, if they could have helped 30, 35, 40,000 people, like the poor population of Judea may not have been that many people. They could have made a significant difference. And I want you to see what it says in verse 6. Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me, for you always have the poor with you. Whenever you want, you can do good to them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. This is a side point, but it's related. There's a lot of talk in church and in culture about something called social justice. Right? You've heard these words. 
social justice, equality, equity. We need to give and we need to do and we need to make sure that we take from ours and give to others. And, and we believe that as the church, we have a job to help other people, but never at the expense of worship, okay? Social justice issues have to be prioritized under the gospel. There are whole denominations now that equate social justice and the gospel. They will say things like the gospel is a cup of cold water from Matthew, right? The gospel is not a cup of cold water. You can drink a cup of cold water and go to hell, right? Okay? Social issues, giving money to poor people, giving lunches to people who need it, giving food, giving clothing, giving these things. They're not bad things, but they have to be prioritized the right way. And I believe that this text is one of the places that we can see that that's the case. Because he was saying that Mary prioritized what? Worship. Mary prioritized worship. She could have given that money. She could have sold it. I want you to see and you need to know. We're not talking about feeding 15 or 20 little kids. We're talking about feeding thousands of people. And Jesus actually gives her kudos for not doing that, but for worshiping him. Our social justice must always come out of our gospel understanding. Our social causes and the things that we do to help other people are important things, but they have to come out of our worship. And there are the two strands. There are the social gospel equals the gospel, and then there are the we don't need to do any social work. Neither of those are okay. But we have to get the priorities correct. Mary gets those correct. I want you to turn to John 12, because I want you to see some of the details that John puts in this story. John chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Turn there with me. <clears throat> and you'll see what I mean by the time markers that are here. Again, Mark 14, 1 says it was two days before the Passover when the chief priests and the scribes wanted to kill Jesus. John chapter 12, verse 1 says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, and we're going to have this event. Again, as I said before, Mark is, is uh, recording this thematically. John is recording it chronologically. It says, Six days before the Passover, John chapter 12, verse 1, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was. You guys remember Lazarus? He's the guy that got risen from the dead, risen from the grave. Remember King James? He stinketh, that dude. And here he is. He's hanging out. Now, what are you doing if you end up having a funeral for somebody, and then a couple days later, they come out, they knock on the door, and it's them? What are we doing? We throwing a party? Are we going to have a good time? Or are we just going to be like, no, we're Baptists. We don't party. Maybe a potluck, but I hope the resurrected guy brought something good. All right? Lazarus was there. Verse 2, so they gave a dinner for him there. They're going to throw a party for Lazarus. Lazarus had not been resurrected. There's a difference between resurrection and what happened to Lazarus because Lazarus would die again later. But Lazarus had been dead, and now he was alive, and that's a really good reason to throw a party. It says they threw a dinner for him there. Martha served. You guys remember Martha? Martha's always serving. Here she is again. Lazarus was one of those chilling, reclining with him at the table. He's just hanging with Jesus. Because if, if you were dead for four days and you just got back, you get to take a little rest. Verse 3, Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair. Mark said that she anointed his head. John says she anointed his feet. Is there a, is there a contradiction there? No. She anointed this whole body. Make sense? The house then was filled with the fragrance. You need to see that, that the house was filled. This is very fragrant, okay? This is like you spray the perfume, ladies, and maybe you get overzealous with it a little bit, and the house is filled with the scent, okay? And we won't put any, like, you know, teenage girls under pressure right here and say anything about fragrances. But we all know what it's like to have our houses filled with fragrances, that's happening in this instance, and he's telling us that because when Jesus gets this on his entire body, as he'll say in a few, or as he already said, we read in Mark, that she was, she didn't know it, but she was preparing his body for burial. 
Mary didn't know that that's what she was doing, but Jesus knew it. So one of the things that many people speculate is a little bit of speculation, but it's well-grounded speculation, is that later when Jesus ended up a, a couple days after this, when Jesus ends up in the Garden of Gethsemane and they come in to arrest him, and remember Judas comes in and leans over and kisses him? Guess what probably would have been there at that point, right? That scent may have still been lingering there, in a, again, in a culture where they're not bathing every day and those kinds of things. As they were flogging Jesus, as they were putting the crown of thorns on his head, as they were crucifying him, all of those things, very likely that this scent is still there. And that's why I want you to see in verse 4, John chapter 12, verse 4, who shows up. Mark was nice. In Mark's account, Mark said that there were some people who weren't very happy about this. John, not so nice. He throws one dude under the bus. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, oh, parentheses, he who was about to betray him, John wants to make sure we know who we're talking about here, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Oh, Judas cares about poor people. There's a, there's a document called the Gospel of Judas. It was written a few hundred years after the canonical Gospels. You can actually read the Gospel of Judas. It makes Judas out to be the good guy. Judas is the guy who's like really trying to help Jesus to establish his kingdom, do what Jesus is supposed to do. And the Gospel of Judas actually tries to paint Judas as the good guy. And you know what's crazy? Is that you can actually find people today who believe those things, scholars who believe those things. Judas was actually the good guy and was doing what he was supposed to. See, he cared about the poor. Verse 6, John 12, 6. He said this not because he cared about the poor, oh, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you always have with you. You do not always have me. Uh, I want to contrast, show you a contrast of a few things about Judas and a few things about Mary. Because it will draw all of this together. From these two accounts, as we put them together, I want you to see that Mary, church, loved Jesus. Is there any doubt that Mary loved Jesus? She went all in on her worship. There was no holding back. There was no partial worship. That she was an all or nothing kind of gal. And she went all in on her worship. Mary loved Jesus. Judas loved who? Judas. Judas loved himself. Mary praised Jesus. There are about three different times in the gospel accounts that we see Mary. Every single time. You know where she's at? She's at the feet of Jesus. She's at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus teach. Earlier in John, Jesus is teaching. She's listening, and Martha's running around doing dishes. Remember that story? Then later, Lazarus dies, and Mary runs, finds Jesus. She falls down at his feet, and she's there begging for the life of her brother. And here we find Mary at the feet of Jesus in adoration and worship. Mary praised Jesus. Judas plotted against Jesus. Number three, Mary sacrificed herself. While Judas sacrificed Jesus. Mary gave a big, intense, extravagant sacrifice from herself. Whereas Judas was willing to sacrifice Jesus to get for himself. And that brings us to the next point. That Mary used money to adore Jesus. And Judas used Jesus to obtain money. You see the difference? And here's something really important to note, by the way. Mary used money to adore Jesus. How much? A year's wage. 300 denarii, a year's wages. Do you remember from the other gospel accounts how much money Judas actually got? It was a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. How much money Judas got for betraying Jesus? 30 pieces of silver. Some of you are like, I would love that. I'll take that. That sounds like a lot. Exodus tells us that 30 pieces of silver was the price of a slave in that day. It was not much money at all. It was a pittance compared to a year's wages. And I want you to see that Mary was willing to, to give all of that to Jesus, whereas Judas just wanted to use Jesus to obtain money for himself. And finally, what I want you to see is this, is that Mary will forever be remembered as a worshiper. Judas will forever be remembered as a traitor. Mary will forever, that's what it says, that's what Jesus said right there in Mark 14, verse 9. I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. I'm standing here today to tell you about Mary, 
because Mary is always remembered as a worshiper. We laugh about not naming your kid Judas because Judas will always be remembered as a traitor. All of that brings me to this point, church. This one point. True worship is never wasted. True worship is never wasted. Like adoring Jesus. And people will tell you it's a waste. I've had people tell me that what I'm doing with my life is a waste of my life. Oh, you could take the things that you do and go so, and make much, a lot more money doing something else, standing in front of people and talking, right? You have people who spend their whole lives serving God and, and giving. You have people who say, you give money to the government and taxes and you give money to the church, you're crazy. But worship is never a waste. People might tell you that it's a waste. They might tell you that you're wasting your money in giving to the church or giving to ministry. They will tell you that you're wasting your time by coming to church, by serving the Lord. They'll tell you that you're wasting your life by not pursuing the same things and going after the same things as everyone else goes after. And what people are saying in that moment is that worship is a waste. And I'm here to tell you that Mary shows us that worship is never a waste. That real worship with your life is never wasted. So as we go into the Holy Week, as we start today, and as we continue to move through this week, and you go about the things that you do, we come together on Good Friday, we come together on Easter Sunday, I just want us to know that Jesus is worth adoring. And I want us to ask two questions. Are there places in my life where I might be opposing Jesus? Have I been threatened by Jesus? Have I in some way been disappointed in Jesus? Like, where might be the place in my life that I could be opposing Jesus? I've had these expectations, and he hasn't met my expectations, and I'm not very happy about it. I want us to dig into that this week and to think about, are there places that I'm opposing Jesus? And then the next piece of that is, how could I replace opposing with adoring? How could I replace some of that opposition to Jesus with adoration and praise and worship? I'll give you a real specific way. As I said before, we have the sermon supplement. We have it available in a bunch of different places. But on the bottom of the sermon supplement this week, there's some on the back table. You can get them online. I put six days worth of, of reading. I would challenge you, and these are just the, the crucifixion accounts, the, the Passion Week accounts for six days. I would challenge you, whether it's you and your spouse, you, your spouse, and your kids, you by yourself, take 30 minutes every day this week. Take 30 minutes every day this week and spend some time adoring Jesus as you read his word, as you think about what he's done for you. Then come together on Good Friday and be excited about what God has done for us and we'll adore him together. And Easter Sunday, you think we're going to do some adoring? Like we're going to do some serious adoring. We're going to be excited and it's going to be amazing. That's just one way that we can adore and worship and praise him together. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, and maybe this is just like, oh, I thought Easter was this Sunday, not next Sunday. What did I do? Right? Nope, you've got to come back next week. Sorry. But if you're here today and you're not a Christian, the first step in ad adoring Jesus is accepting him. Accepting him as your Savior. Placing your faith in him. Admitting that you're a sinner. Believing that he died in your place for your sins. And confessing him as your Savior and your Lord. So I would invite you this morning to accept Christ as your Savior. And then to get about adoring him. Amen? I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning. We're going to close in a word of prayer. And I want to say this as we close. There is a specific connection to Good Friday in this text because Mary took the most extravagant gift that she could have and she poured it out on Jesus. On Good Friday, you know what we're going to celebrate? The most extravagant gift ever given, poured out. It's called the blood of Jesus. The most extravagant gift ever given, poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. That's the connection. So let's be excited about it this week. I'll pray. Father, we do love you. We adore you. We adore your son. We're thankful for the opportunity to come and sing songs of praise to you today. We're excited to be able to open your word. God, thank you for the way that you inspired Mark to write down these uh, events and, and put them together in such a way that we can see what this lady did. And God, for those of us who are here, probably at one point or another, all of us have had some kind of disappointment, some kind of way that we've opposed your son. I pray that we would be honest and real with ourselves as we think about that. And God, I pray that you would help us to replace that opposition with adoration, that we would be thankful, that we would praise you. And even as we read your word and study and, 
and celebrate what you've done for us with this Easter season, that we would continue to adore you. God, I thank you that we can come together as a church family, um, that we can be um, just strengthened together because we need it. And I just pray that you would continue to do that this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys, thank you for being here today. We'll see you next week.